Welcome to in Building Emergency Responder Radio Enhancement Communication Systems. My name is Craig Sells. Thank you for watching my video. Communication and emergency. Can you imagine being in this scenario as a fireman trying to put out a fire and not having your radio and communication work, whether you're outside of the building trying to communicate to the firefighters inside or inside in this environment? trying to communicate to those outside who are trying to help you. We go back to 9-11. There was a National Security Council that was put together immediately after the incident. The role of the National Security Council was to find what it was that we could potentially prevent from ever transpiring again from the lessons that we learned in 9-11. One of the very first findings that the National Security Council found was that the firemen that were inside of Tower 2 after Tower 1 had fallen were not able to get communication on their radios. It is suspected that over 400 individuals perished that may have otherwise been able to have been saved had the radios inside of the buildings actually worked. As a result of this finding, the National Security Council gave a recommendation that an in-building emergency responder communication system be developed and implemented as part of code. The NFPA, which is the National Fire Prevention Association, came out with in roughly 2004, what is referred to as Code 72. The IFC, which is the International Fire Communications, acknowledged that this was actually a good idea, and they came out with very shortly thereafter what is called Section 510. In 2007, the NFPA came out with 1221, which as we see here stands for the Standard for the Installation, Maintenance, and Use of Emergency Services communication systems. And you'll see we have a 2016 edition. And as of the beginning of 2019, just a few weeks ago, they came out with a TIA for the updated version of the 20 of the 1221. In the state of Florida, the state actually decided at a state level to implement a statute that actually is called 633.207. Per that statute, it actually is broken down in three different phases. Upon signing, which the governor of the state of Florida in 2016 had done, <clears throat> immediately enacted that statute and had a direct impact on new construction and remodeling projects. Phase two and phase three would be affecting pre-existing commercial and then the latter pre-existing residential buildings. Although Florida is the first state to do it at a state level, there are many states within the United States that have implemented similar type statutes, if at the very least for new construction, and many of whom are, are considering now for pre-existing. When we talk about in-building systems, we're actually talking about two different types of systems. But ultimately, they both are fundamentally the same in that they're a distributed intended system. As you see here, it stands for DAS. And what a DAS system does is it actually takes a signal that is received from a donor tower in the immediate area of the dwelling itself, brings that signal into the building, <clears throat> where it's then amplified by a bi-directional amplifier and then distributed throughout the entire building. Our sources can either be from the outdoor network, the radio tower, or directly from base station radios. But typically, we see an off-air signal. As I mentioned already, we've got two different types of system we predominantly see. The first we'll discuss is the passive DAS configuration. And in this picture, you'll see we have what is referred to as the Yagi antenna that's mounted on the top of the building. Then we have coaxial cable that's bringing it down to the ground level. 
where you see the first red box on the far left side of this picture that actually is referred to as bidirectional amplifier or BDA. It is a requirement in most jurisdictions that the BDA have a battery backup. The amount of hours that the battery backup is rated for is contingent upon whether or not there's a level one generator in the building. Be aware, IFC, for the most part, requires 24 hours. NFPA requires 12 hours. The second type of configuration is an active DAS configuration. This is a hybrid type system. Again, it is similar that an, a Yagi antenna is mounted on the top of the building that's receiving the signal from a local tower. Again, it is, brings down the signal through the coaxial cable down to a BDA. But herein lies the difference. At the BDA, where it's mounted, right next to that is actually a system, a POI DAS, had an optical distribution device that will transition the equipment to fiber, so it's a light signal at this point in time. On the four floors, one through five, you see remotes. At those remotes, the signal is converted from fiber, which is light source, to a coaxial cable, and the RF signal goes across the coax on the horizontal runs to the antennas that you see, which are strategically placed. We use software systems, typically IB Wave, to be able to figure out what are the best locations based on several parameters and where the antenna should be placed. There are many types of venues that are actually great environments for an active DAS, some of whom are large buildings, malls, stadiums and arenas, large hospitals, college campuses, and casinos. Depending upon the different variables, the size of the building, square footage, oftentimes a rule of thumb, if a building is 500,000 square feet or less, it may very well be able to utilize a passive DAS system. However, if it's over 500,000 square feet, an active DAS may be necessary with remotes to be able to overcome the large footprint of the building. 